This is episode 152 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Mike Shum. Mike has been involved in real estate in many capacities for 35 plus years. He's also the co-founder of Profits Coaching, which is an on-market coaching company. But Mike has also been my coach for more than five years and a very good friend of mine. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Jonathan. I was uh, so excited for this uh, episode. So thanks for the opportunity to talk with you. It's always, uh, whenever I get to meet with you, I learn something. And then uh, just to share a little bit, uh, uh, it's a great opportunity. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. And yeah, it's fun for us since we are always talking, texting, and then coaching to bring this out. And the reason why I wanted to bring you on the investing podcast, because of course you were on my agent podcast that is now defunct, The Art of Agency. Uh, is to bring this more mindful approach to investors and your wide experience in the real estate game. I really think from how much you've helped me can really help other investors who are, it's a little bit of a weird time for real estate <laughs> as you are well aware. So yeah. I think this is really the time for people to bring in the focus. Have you found that just in regard to real estate in general, which does involve a lot of agents who invest, that people are kind of uh, biting their nails right now? <laughs> Well, yeah, like what's happening right now is there's a lot of uncertainty in the markets. So this basic human psychology, when interest rates are fluctuating, there's new laws coming in from uh, DOJ law, law, lawsuits on there, inventories, levels have been really low around the country. We've got these hedge funds buying a lot of houses, builders, instead of selling, renting their houses. And the consumer is like, oh my gosh, what's going on? So when there's a lot of uncertainty in someone's life, the first thing they do is nothing. They're like. I'm not sure what the right answer is. The agent's telling me this, the news is saying that, the, right? And they, they just will definitely just stop doing anything just so they can get more certainty in their life. One thing that I really want to talk about is part of the biggest problem for investors now, and I talk about this all the time, is that your traditional home buyer is now in competition with investors because there's so little inventory that they're willing to try to buy more dumpy properties thinking that they can renovate them and they can pay way more than investors because we're investors. We're not living there. Are you seeing this across the board? Wow. So we definitely think alike because this is definitely one of the topics I wanted to bring up today. Go back to like the 07 French. That's exactly what I saw. The same situation with stock. Uh, Bitcoin is a good example. A couple of years ago is if you understand the early adoption curve, most Americans are scared of early adoption. So they wait to see what the masses start to do. Yeah. Jump into a Bitcoin or GameStop when it was flying a couple of years ago. Yeah. And then all they just have is downside. So it's the same thing there is that in a way, the investors, like when the foreclosures they were playing, and then after we started to come out of that, my my clients were the retail buyers said, Hey, I'm a, I'm a flipper now. I got a partner. I got a money guy. And without evaluating enough properties and just looking hungry for something to, that everyone's making so much money on, they bought properties rehab them and then call me and said, oh shit, we're upside down. What should I do? Yeah. You know, there's money. We're stuck. There's nothing. And what's so crazy is it wasn't just them. It was giant companies. Zillow and Open Door did the exact same thing in Arizona. They just, they're like, oh, well, let's buy a bunch of properties at, a, at too high of a valuation. And then they eventually had to dump them all. I mean, one of the terrible business decisions, but the single regular people and regular investors are following these trends. I think they feel like, it's such a weird time because you have the subset that we're talking about who sit on the sidelines and then you have this other subset who feel so desperate that they have to get something so they make a bad decision. And like, there has to be a good way in the middle. Where's the way to keep the mindset right to stay in the middle and not, you know, be so crazy that you overpay crazily for something and then can't make it back and also don't just sit on your ass for you. Generally, people are watching the news, so they're seeing these, you know, gigantic things about rates and they're not focusing on their own local market. I feel like no matter what rates are at, no matter what's going on in the market, if I'm an expert in my local market, no matter what part of real estate I'm in, I can find and make deals because I know it better than everybody. Is that something that you believe as well? Oh my gosh. Being a hyper local expert is everything. There, there are pockets everywhere within, within neighborhoods and areas. Some will move faster. I'll give you a, a good example there. I, most of my career is working on Long Island. And of course, everyone's enamored with the higher price point, uh, the luxury market. There is so much old money up in the North Shore of Long Island. When the markets slow down, the turnover becomes 1% tangible. Yeah. 
it's impossible like to market and do farming because you, you can't get enough of a return on there. So I, I believe firmly, I learned this from like the stock market. This is a funny quote, which somebody told me that bulls make money and bears make money, but pigs get slaughtered. So if I'm a luxury broker and if that market's not moving, I learned I have to move to another market, even though it may not be the ideal one for me or the one I enjoy most. So in a good example, doing retail all through uh, my, I started in 03. So retail, retail, five, six, oh seven, yeah. Long Island, one in four homes with a short sale. Right. Then, then the foreclosures came. So I opened up an Indy Mac account and I did uh, for about two or three years. Did I like them? No, but that's what the market was giving me. So I didn't want to challenge it. Where is the opportunity? There is always, whether it's up or down, there's always an opportunity in a market. It's our job to find. Yeah. And I think investors suffer from that kind of FOMO of the major market. It's like someone who comes to me now and says, oh, I want to invest in Austin, Texas. I'm like, well, you're definitely 10 years too late. Not that you can't make money there, but I always say like, okay, just as you were saying, you take the town, whatever it is, say Smithtown, that's your town. Okay. And then you go two towns out in each direction and see which one is just trending a little bit. Wait, is that a Trader Joe's coming in? Then you just focus on that neighborhood. And I think that as an investor, you can do that if you're, you know, baby investor or experienced, you just have to kind of adjust and go with it and keep your foot on the pedal. It doesn't, I think the problem with what people think is when we're saying like, keep at it, take action, they think that means buying. You don't have to buy to take action. You have to be in mo motion so you don't lose your momentum, right? Well, sometimes others like things have made mistakes I've seen is that they don't realize like almost every job is going to be take longer and it's going to cost you oh, more. Yeah. I think of permitting issues that you've had also with the town and stuff and delays like that. And they're not prepared for that. And then they're, they're caught with their pants down they're running out of phones and what do I do kind of stuff. I get a lot of those kind of calls to kind of get them out of a situation. They didn't do the research. Yeah. And, and they, I think again, emotionally, they're too invested. You remember where Mike was talking about a deal I had where I got a red card on a flip and it took me 22 months to eventually sell. I, I was fine. I wasn't thrilled with what was going on. I ended up like breaking even still after 22 months, which is a miracle, but like, I loved that house. I still love that house. So, I mean, I was emotionally prepared, but I'm high EQ, low emotion in general. But I right. think it's really important, especially for new investors to learn, because the reason why people are overpaying as investors is because they're too emotionally invested. You know, they feel like they're desperate. And when you're emotionally invested to a piece of real estate, you make bad decisions. You know, it's like three heirs who say, hey, we don't want to sell because our parents lived here. I understand the emotional connection, but like you three are never going to agree. I learned from my dad growing up that when the house is worth a lot, you sell it. I remember my dad coming, he had built, we had this house in, in, in Westchester that was like the greatest house I've ever lived in. He got it at a foreclosure. It was like 60 acres and he did everything. We had like a regular house, a back house, basketball court, tennis court, two goats, chickens, pond in the front, a pool. Like it was amazing, you know, like, and then he comes to me one day, I mean, he picks me up for the weekend. I'm probably like, I don't know, like 12, 13. And he's like, oh, by the way, we're selling this house. I'm like, are you kidding? This is like the greatest house ever. He's like, well, we're going to make a million dollars. I'm like, okay. Even at 12 or 13, <laughs> Sorry. That, that's starting to make sense. But you know how people are like, this is actually, this is a good, a good discussion to have because I think, you know, we were saying a, most of our biggest investments all start as a personal residence, but I think unfortunately people are in this like forever home mentality. I, uh, nothing's a forever home to me. I, I like moving. And when it's worth a lot, I want to take the money and buy something better or downsize and take more money and invest in another property. They don't understand. I learned this concept, uh, doing commercial real estate and business brokerage, all businesses and all, and for most case in commercial buildings, if you talk to their owners, everything is always for sale for the right price. Yeah. 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 They're not attached. For it. It's a business. It's making me money. If it, I can get a great price for the building or the business, it's, it will sell. You won't see a lot of them for sale, right? Because they don't need to sell, but for the, the right offer, every one of them probably would sell.